Good morning, Elam Church. Happy Easter. Welcome, welcome, Thank welcome. Thank you for being here and joining us. This is the second service of the day, so this is just a continuation of the celebration that we have been enjoying together as a church family as we worship Jesus, as we celebrate his resurrection yeah. and what he's done on the cross for us. We want to welcome you, especially if you're new or a guest joining us. Thank you for coming. Thank you for experiencing this celebration with us. And we would love to connect with you. My name is Trina. This is my husband, Lucas. And we have the joy and the privilege of getting to serve and pastor and lead in this place. This is a great church. We Amen. have been so welcomed by this community. And we yeah. want you to feel that welcome as well. So thank you again for being here. Head to our atrium after the service where there's a photo booth. You can take a family photo. There's team members who want to connect with you. Grab a cup of coffee. We really, really just want this to feel like a place where you can feel like you belong. And we're here yes. to connect with you and be intentional about being in community together. Amen. I, I saw a baby chick outside. Did you see that? No one else saw that? Uh, the duck? And, uh, you, okay, I got some waves as if you held one. I, a little kid was holding one. I went to give him a fist bump. And he's like, don't do that. <laughs> because I almost heard a baby chick, but all is good. The chick is alive, but more importantly, Jesus is alive. Amen? Listen, I want to do something with you. I want to do something with you, a, a wonderful tradition of the church, and I think you know it. Um, I'm going to say something. You say something back to me. If you know it, say it uh, loud and proud. He is risen, church. Okay, I want to tell you something. The 9 a.m. was so much louder than you, and I told them that. I would tell you that. Um, and they were, they were with me. They kind of, they really gave it some gusto. And, and I would like to hear a little bit more from me. He is risen, church. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Not bad. Not bad. We'll try it again later a little bit more. No, I'm just kidding. Would you stand to your feet? We are so grateful you are here this morning. We start every service, especially if you're new, with worship. God is moving. God is present. He is alive today. It's Resurrection Sunday, church. And so today, more than any other day, let's have some joy in the house. Amen? Today, more than any other day, let the praise come up to heaven. Amen? Let today, more than any other day, be filled with celebration and gratitude because God is faithful to fulfill His promise. He was dead, buried, but then He rose again. Amen? So we sing and we give Him all the praise. Let me pray. Lord, we love You and we worship You. Thank You, Jesus, that You have risen. On Resurrection Sunday, more than any other Sunday, Lord, we choose to say thank You for the cross. Thank You for who You are. We love You and we celebrate this morning with all that we have. And everybody said... Come on, let's sing. Come on, Jesus. Jesus is risen.
in him, amen. I was buried beneath, you know it, my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It wasn't my turn. Till I met him. I was breathing the night of life. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Till I met you. Declare it. You call me. Through the 
darkness, your loving kindness, Lord, through the shadows of my soul, the work is finished, the end is written, for Jesus Christ, you're my living. the promise your very body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me oh let's declare it then came the
Till from heaven you can run it. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To every virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to the cradle. risen oh come on we can do it he is risen listen this song that we just sang will sing praise forever to the king of kings listen i don't know if we fully grasp the power of that declarative statement i don't know if we fully understand but when we're saying that we are saying that death does not reign in our world 
that darkness does not reign, that light, that love, that Christ sits on the throne above all thrones, that there is no anxiety, there is no fear, there is no doubt, there is nothing that is greater than him. There is no power of this earth, there is no principality that stands above him. So can we sing that chorus one more time, but this time can we really declare it? Can we say it like it's true? Can we say it like we just left an empty tomb and we see that our king is alive and we're declaring it for all the nations here. Can we sing that one more time? Can we do that, band? Let's do it one more time. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Father, God, we praise you this morning. God, we lift up our voices. God, we raise our hands. God, we celebrate in the triumph that you have over the grave. God, on this Easter Sunday, God, this holy day, we celebrate that you defeated the worst that this world could throw at us. God, you defeated death. You defeated sin. God, you tore the veil that comes between us and you. And God, now there's nothing that stands between us. God, we praise you because when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, when you look at us, you no longer see sin. You just see something that was worth dying for. God, we praise you because the sin has been paid for. God, the check was written and is cleared, and we have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. God, we celebrate this morning because the tomb is empty. And God, I pray right now for all of us, God, that we can just feel that resurrection power as, as Pastor Lucas is going to come and preach. And God, that we can walk in confidence in that. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Listen, you guys can grab a seat. Junior highs, you guys are free to go hang out with the team there. And if you're looking for extra seats, there's going to be a few more. Hey, welcome to church this morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. It is good to see that everyone got the memo that we're not at 1030, that we're at 11 today. We were a little worried, but by the fact that there's zero free seats here, I think that that's a pretty good indication that we made. If you are new, just so you know, if you come at 11 next week, you will be a little bit late. We do normally meet at 1030. Now, if you are wanting to get more connected, the best way to do that would be to grab a connection card. There's one in the seat pocket in front of you, or you can head online and you can click start here, and that's a great place for us to connect with you. We don't want to harass you or bother you, but we just want to say, hey, welcome to the church family. How can we help you? How can we walk through this life with you. It is an incredible journey and we want to travel with you. Speaking of that incredible journey, there is an incredible tool that we use here at Elam called the Alpha Course. Quick show of hands. Has anyone ever heard of Alpha before? I'm seeing lots of hands across this place. Alpha is an incredible tool. Here's what it is if you're wondering. If you've got questions about faith or you're not entirely sure if this is for you yet or you know someone that wants to know more about Jesus or should know more about Jesus, the Alpha Course is perfect for them. You come together on a Wednesday, you have a meal, you have great discussions around really good videos and that is starting up again when Wednesday, April the 17th, and it's going to be really an important step and a great thing to be involved in. Actually, we've got a b little video that's going to do a better job explaining Alpha than I will, so we're going to take a look at that for a second. Life moves fast, doesn't it? Every day, there is so much to fit in. But do you ever stop and think, what's the point of it all? Do you ever ask yourself, is there more to life than this? Alpha is a series of sessions exploring life, faith and meaning. It's a space to explore the big questions, to say what you think and hear other people's points of view. First up, there's food, then a talk, 
followed by a discussion. Each talk explores a different aspect of the Christian faith. And then in the small group, you get to say exactly what you think. The aim of the talk is to spark conversation, each week unpacking a different question. There's no obligation to say anything, and there's nothing you can't say. Seriously. It's an opportunity to hear from others and contribute your own perspective in an honest, friendly and open environment. Why not try it out? So once again, that Alpha course is starting up again April the 17th. It's a Wednesday night. And honestly, it's an incredible opportunity just to dive deeper into your faith and dive deeper into relationship and into community. We believe really strongly that growth happens face-to-face -face around a table, so it's not just someone dictating what's going on. It's a real open and honest conversation. And honestly, from a staff level, honest, on a weekly basis, we hear incredible stories of things that coming out of Alpha, people's lives being changed, people coming to know Christ, just incredibly awesome things. And a lot of that, truthfully, is a result of the giving that takes place at this church. And we are going to be taking up an offering as we normally do, and we've got lots of ways to give. You can partner with us through giving online. If you want to give with cash or with a check, there are kiosks in the atrium. You can also text to give. And when you give to Elam, you're not just giving to, like, cover everyone's salaries and things like that. You're actually giving to life change. You're giving to stories, like you're going to hear some testimony today as Pastor Lucas is going to be preaching. You're also giving to our next-gen department, which I don't know if you saw, this entire area was filled with kids. Can I just say, a little bragging moment on, on my team here, our next-gen department is averaging over 500 people every single week here at Elam. It's incredible. And every person represent is a, it's, it's not just about numbers, it's souls, it's families that are encountering the love of Jesus, and it's life change. There's tons of people in this room right now that are sitting here because someone invested in a church at some point, and that program reached you and found you. So when you are giving, that is what you are giving to. I'm now going to invite up Pastor Lucas as the video plays. Early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, Mary and others were on their way to the tomb. They asked each other, who will roll the stone away? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. This is the good news. This is Jesus. This is resurrection power. Come on, Elam Church. I know someone's excited about that. Thankful for that. One more time, if you are new, may I just welcome you here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so grateful you're here at church. Um, like Trina said at the very start, we just want to welcome you for you to feel connected. We want you to know that there's a next step after just coming, and that's to join in, in into community, into faith. We met some people after our, our 9 a.m. and just how it's their first time or they're fairly new. And we just want you to know it is our heart that you would feel really deeply connected here. It's a big, it's a big space, isn't it? And it would be easy to come and be anonymous. And so don't do that. Find someone's name today. We want to connect with you. Uh, again, we're just grateful. It's Easter Sunday. Best Sunday, hey? It's a good one. That's a good one. Um, you know, our Easter celebration started, we believe, kind of on Good Friday. Even last Sunday, we really kind of transitioned into a time of resurrection life and power. We had our Good Friday service. We're, we're here today, obviously, and we're going to celebrate and keep going, keep going forward. But next Sunday, I, wanna, I want you to know, it's like almost like the final part, part three, if you will. We're going to have... 14 baptism next Sunday, which is more than we had all last year as a church. And so would you join us next Sunday? It, it will be another just a celebration of life, of power, of transformation. And we really are so grateful for every single person who's getting in the tank. Lots of young people. It's going to be so good. It's Easter weekend, obviously, like I've said a, a few times now. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. He was seen hanging on dead on a cross, buried, and yet now he is risen again. As we heard in that video, people came to the tomb early in the morning, and yet he was not there. There lay just linen cloths, and, and the tomb was, the stone was rolled away, and people didn't know where he went, and 
Mary has this conversation. The disciples, John and Peter, they run to the tomb. They don't know what's going on. Peter especially, his best friend, does not find Jesus there. Church, there's no way I can downplay the significance of Easter Sunday. It's resurrection power. It's life change. Jesus took the sin of the world, nailed it to a cross, bearing the weight, our shame, of sin, of of shame. The Pharisees, the Romans, the enemy, everyone thought the battle was taken care of. And yet here we are today, celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ. That death could not hold him. That there is victory in Jesus. One more time, can I get an amen? He was buried dead and now he is risen. And as I read the story this year, as I look at the Easter story, as I really dove deep more into the trial and the different pieces and all the Good Friday, and now when I get to Sunday, I think in my heart, man, what a comeback, hey? Like, come on. Everyone loves a great comeback story, right? Everyone does, right? When Listen, I'm not a Tom Brady fan, but when he came back from 28-3 in Super Bowl 51, wow, not bad, right? No one likes Tom Brady? Good to know. We'll never talk about him again. That's fine. Good to know. Zero Patriot fans. Good to know. Tiger Woods, right, when he had his crazy years, and then he comes back in 2019 to win the Masters behind two strokes. Like, that was a big deal. I think for me, the, there's no greater comeback story than the 2014 gold medal game in women's hockey. Now, let me just tell you something. There's a lot of good moments in my life. Easter Sunday, getting married to Trina. But watching Canadians beat Americans at hockey is up there. <laughs> like, if we have one Mar- American in here. Good to know. You were loved. You were totally loved, just not as much as us when it comes to hockey. Um, you get football, okay? It's like football, and then there's college football, and then there's the CFL. Let's be honest. But, <laughs> but, but, but when it comes to hockey, God loves us more, okay? In 2014, I'll never forget it, I was painting and I was trying to do a bunch of things. I'm watching this game and we're down 2 nothing. first period, second period, third period. There's three minutes left. It's the gold medal game. It's the Olympics. It's Canada versus America. And of course, it's, if we win our gold, this would be the fourth consecutive gold medal that we would win. And it's three minutes left and we get a fluky goal. Now it's 2-1. And I'm like, it's going to happen. Jesus loves us. This is going to happen for sure, right? And so that's, this is what happens. And, and, and then the Americans get the puck actually and we pull our goalie and they fire it down. And I think this is it. They're finally going to beat us and we're never going to hear the end of it ever again. And all the Americans know what I'm talking about. Um, and what happens? The puck hits the post. And in that moment, I knew that Jesus loved us more. I did. <laughs> And, and we get the puck, we call timeout, long story short, we fire one in, 2-2, we go to overtime, and 10 minutes in that overtime, the Canadian women in 2014 win their fourth consecutive gold medal. Come on, somebody. I know you were there too. And we've won more after it, and we will continue to win more. I love a great comeback. With three minutes left out in the third, come on, to score three goals? For those who don't know, we are new to, to this province. We're from BC, and... And so we really want to get our, our kids skating because our kids have never seen ice, let alone, right? Like, and so our, we, we put our kids in skating recently, and Georgia is just, she's so competitive, and she's learning to skate, and, and we see her going hard, and she kind of does that thing where she just pushes with one strong leg right now. And at the end, her final skating lesson, they kind of line the kids up, and Georgia was racing this other girl, and she's got this competitive streak, and we kind of love it about her. And they start to go, and she's skating, and she goes around the cone on the far blue line, and she falls, and she trips, and she catches an edge. And I can just see this disappointment in her, and we see her. And then this girl keeps kind of fl- uh, flying past her. So Georgia gets up, and she's skating, and she's going. And I'm like, this is a, I don't know if she's going to get back from this, but she keeps going. And instead of just doing the one leg, she starts to do both. And she's going, and she's going, and she slides at the very end to beat this girl. And we're at the top just eating like a hot dog, and we're like, yes! Like, we're, we're those parents. We're like, go, oh, Georgia, you beat her. We're like giving her the thumbs up. We get to the car later. She's like, Dad, did you see me? You see me get back up? You see me come back from falling down? I'm like, gee, I saw it. It was amazing. She's like, I know. I came back, and I tied her. Pardon? George Bear, as I lovingly call you, her, you beat that girl, okay? You destroyed her. You came back and you stole, like, I got really intense and Trina was like, Lucas, Georgia, daddy is right. You did beat her, actually. She did say that. You did. 
I love a good comeback story. I love it. It does something in us, doesn't it? Just see something, someone, somebody, whoever it may be, a team, whatever it is, down, beaten, like feeling like there's no hope, feeling like there's, they're totally lost, and yet to see someone come and see a victory. And that's why when we look at Jesus, think about this for a moment. Everybody thought he was dead, gone, buried, and for him to rise again, defeating sin. Because of that truth, we now actually get to live in resurrection power. Because of the comeback, if you will, the resurrection power of Jesus. It's a powerful truth. It is. Because of Jesus, we can live with resurrection power. We can live, live in every day with resurrection power. It's not a flashy statement. It doesn't rhyme, but it's the truth you needed to hear this morning. That no matter how down you feel, how broken it may seem, there is a comeback by Jesus. And it actually is, get, we get to actually take that and inherit it because in Ephesians 1 and Romans 8, we read this, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. Ephesians 1 even says it gives life to our mortal bodies. He was dead, buried, but raised to life. And now we receive the same. But here's the challenge, church, this morning on Easter Sunday. For many of us, we just struggle to believe that. We struggle with life, as anyone does, by the way. And we simply cannot fathom that there is this living hope. Maybe a faint hope, but a living hope. A way forward, a pathway of love and purpose. So maybe you're brand new to this whole Christianity thing. Maybe you're here this morning because someone promised you lunch after. You're welcome here. No, you're, you are welcome here. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for trusting us with your Sunday. Maybe you're a long-term, committed Christian. It doesn't matter, truthfully. We all have struggles. We are not, there's no discrimination here. Like, we all struggle to believe that there is any way out sometimes of the struggle that we're in. Although today is all about Jesus, church, my heart, my mind went to Peter as I prepared for Easter Sunday. You have Peter, who is arguably his best friend, a, a loyal disciple, um, you know, a good leader, a bit reckless, but ready to defend and love Jesus. When Jesus died, he then was resurrected. He begins to talk with people. He has interactions with his disciples. He, he sees a, a man on, on the road to Emmaus, and yet, where is Peter? Where is his best friend? Think about it. Your best friend dies, a death he did predict. Where, where are you in this moment when you're hearing stories that he is alive? When you come to the tomb and you found only linen, where are you? Well, where was Peter? Church, Peter went fishing. And all those who laughed said, hey, listen, a bad day fishing is better than a good day in the office, right? Right? I heard that from a Saskatchewan uncle one time. I get what you're thinking. It's like, it's not a bad place to be. What's the big deal? His best friend rose again. Why is he not with Jesus? I want to show you why. In Luke 22, this moment happens. We didn't talk about this on Good Friday. I wanted to bring it up today. This is right after Jesus is arrested. Before he goes to the cross, the Bible says this. Luke 22, verse 54. Let's read it together. Then seizing him, being Jesus, they led Jesus away and took him into a, the house of a high priest. Peter followed, though, at a distance. Picture this forever. The disciples flee, but Peter is trying his best to stay close to him. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of a courtyard, they sat down together. Peter sat down with them. The servant girl saw him, being Peter now, seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you, you are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him. He is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I, I don't know who, what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. So Jesus predicted this to Peter. He said, before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. In verse 62, I think a place many of us have been in our own life. The Bible says that he went outside and he wept bitterly. I think it's clear now why we know Peter isn't rushing back to see his best friend because the last moment they had together, Peter denied him. Peter disowned him. Peter said, not me. I don't know him. He even denied his own birthright of being a Galilean. He said, no, 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 that's not me. He 
you can imagine the turmoil and the disappointment, the shame that Peter feels within himself. Three years of ministry with his best friend, loyalty, someone Jesus could count on, yet in this moment, he denies even knowing him. The truth is, he did stay there. All the other disciples had fled, but I want you to know, it's not that Peter's a bad disciple, bad person. The truth is, when he sees Jesus get arrested, when he understands the, the weight of what's happening and that his life is now on the line, too, when he's questioned about it, Peter can't handle the weight of death and the weight of the cross. And can I just tell you, that is the good news. None of us can. Peter is not alone in his discouragement here. None of us can handle the weight of the cross. Trina said on Good Friday, Jesus alone went to the garden and then he walked alone to the cross. Why? Because we couldn't. We could not take on this, this heaviness. We could not take on this weight. We need a Savior. It's the truth. It's the weight of the, the, the gospel that there is sin, and it's too heavy for any person to take. None of us can handle it. Resurrection power is not something you give yourself, church. Resurrection power comes from Jesus alone. And it's the good news. It's something he gives us. And you in here may feel a little bit like Peter. Maybe you've said something or done something. In fact, as I read this story, I even thought of a time uh, in my, my high school years of, of people asking me if I was a Christian. And being like, no, not, not really. No, no. Not, 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 sometimes. Easter, maybe. I felt this. I know this. And he's sad and upset because he doesn't feel like he can measure up in this moment. And the truth is, you guys, Jesus is not asking you to measure up today. He's not asking you to have the perfect life, the perfect words. Friends, he's not asking you today to have it all figured out. Today is not about what you can do. It's not about what I can do. It's not about what you have done. He laid down his perfect life. So what, you could have a, a perfect life? No, 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 no. So you could have eternal life. There's a big difference. We believe Jesus gives us life and life to the full here. But that doesn't mean there will not be hardship and challenge and problem and disappointment. That is the weight of sin. It's real. It's honest. But praise Jesus, even though our sin is great, our Savior is greater. That, that death could not hold him. That's the good news. That's what today is about. That yes, there is real, honest, challenging pain, of course. And we would never at Elam Church pretend that it doesn't exist. You don't have to come in and be something you're not. And have it all perfect because it's Easter Sunday. And you, I saw so many kids matching. Way to go, moms. I'm serious. It's so awesome. I love it. And, and you tr like today, like we were trying to get out of the house and be that ready to go pastoral family. And I'm the one that got us late. I was, I was. I, I changed my outfit like nine times. I was so nervous. I, it wasn't like I was nervous. I just had a massive stain. I, it doesn't matter. It's another, another time. The truth is, Peter can only go so far in this walk. And the truth is, all of us can only go so far in our strength. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We can only go so far in our power and our strength. And every person here, Christian, new, old, we need to lean into the resurrection power. So where does Peter go next after he denies him? After this moment, he sees him, of course, like, uh, like we already read at the cross, the empty tomb. But then he goes to a very familiar yet lonely place. It says this in John 21, starting in verse 1. Let's read this together. Afterward, so this is after the resurrection, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they, called, they caught nothing. Excuse me. Verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered, he said. I, I just kind of love that. I feel like Jesus is like, how's it going out there, buds? You know? He's like, got nothing, hey? You need me? You need a little hand? No one else reads the Bible like that? Just me? Okay, good to know. Verse 6, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. This is a familiar moment for Peter. He's been in this position before. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. 
And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragging the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread, and gave it to them, and they did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's recap Peter's life for a moment, shall we? Can we do that? Going all the way back to the start, Peter's on a boat, can't catch much fish. Jesus helps him catch a large amount of fish. He's then called to be a disciple, a fisher of men, if you will, life, ministry. Peter has this beautiful moment later in the Gospels where he walks on water, has the faith to keep his eyes fixated on Jesus. Peter actually calls Jesus the Messiah. He boldly preaches the gospel. He, he sees healing. He sees God move. He, he hands out the baskets, if you will, of, of many loaves and fish. He, he has his own mother-in-law is healed by Jesus. He has a moment where people are trying to take Jesus from him, and he, he cuts off someone's ear out of d- defending his best friend, his rabbi. And then he denies him three times, and he's on a boat, unable to catch much fish. All of this life, all of this ministry, all of this together with Jesus, he denies him three times, and he goes back to this familiar, kind of lonely, desperate place he was first found in. Peter is moved by seeing Jesus, and so he puts on that outer garment because he doesn't want to come kind of in his work attire, which was basically nothing to the Lord. He jumps out, but he doesn't say anything. You notice that? Like, it wasn't Peter who ran and found Jesus. It was Jesus who was on the shore finding Peter. It wasn't Peter who came up and said, I'm so sorry, Lord, forgive me. It was Jesus who spoke the first words. It wasn't Peter who formed together a breakfast and a meal to share with his best friend. It was Jesus who had a fire going again. Peter denied Jesus three times at a charcoal fire in the night. And now Jesus comes again, shows him around the fire, and is about to have a transforming moment with just Peter. I do want to point out this 153, it's a very exact number. Some people say that 153 is the added numerical value of Greek words, Peter and fish. Some say it's the Hebrew. Some say it's, uh, many people have an interpretation. My personal favorite is Father Jerome, who was an early church father, pointed out and believed that there were 153 fish in the Sea of Galilee at this point. Meaning that every type of person, no matter where you're from, no matter where you're born, Jesus wants to do ministry and life with you. He's gathering every person to him, meaning every person, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every single one of us can be with Jesus. Amen? At the end of the day, whatever the meaning is of the 153 of the moment, Peter went fishing. Peter has denied Jesus three times, and he is saying nothing to Jesus. I think there is an incredible amount of doubt in Peter's life right now. Despite all that he knew, I think for many of us, we are like Peter, where we feel uncertain. You've been around church or Jesus, you, 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 but you're scared to maybe talk to him. You're scared to maybe come running to him and explain what's going on. The truth is, church, Jesus is alive. He has risen. He sees us in our doubt, in our fears, and he is coming to us. He is walking on the shore saying, he's calling out. He's saying, come, come be with me. Come feast, come. This resurrection life, this resurrection power is for you. And yet there's so many of us, we're like Peter, just nervous and cautious and uncertain. Why? Because of our sin, something we've done. Jesus is saying, there is no amount of doubt that can interrupt my plans for you. There is no amount of doubt that Peter has in this moment that can interrupt the plans that Jesus has, the purpose that Jesus has for Peter. Peter is not just going to be some guy on the side. Like, he is going to build God's church. He is going to do ministry. The next thing for Peter, you would see in Acts, is a sermon that saves more than 3,000 people. Peter has a plan. There is a purpose on his life, but he can't see it in this moment. But can I tell you, especially today on Resurrection Sunday, that there is no amount of doubt that can interrupt God's plans. 
verse 15, it says this. When they had finished eating, so they had a whole meal, a whole meal together and still nothing. Finally, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know all things. You know that I love you. So Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then in verse 19, he said to Peter, Peter, follow me. When Jesus has used the word, do you love me, he's saying, do you agape love me? It's this Greek word for this sacrificial, unconditional love from God. When, when Peter responds with, Lord, you know I love you, he responds with this phileo Greek word, which is brotherly love. So he's like, Peter, do you love me sacrificially? And Peter's like, of course I do, bro. <laughs> like, of course I do, buddy. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm loyal to you, Jesus. Do, but do you love me? Will you give it all up? Will you do whatever it asks for? Yeah, yeah, of course, Jesus, you know. And then finally that third time, Jesus meets Peter where he's at, and he goes, do you, phileo, brotherly love, love me? And Peter responds, yes, you know, I love you. Jesus was stretching Peter to move him past phileo love, into this agape love. But notice he didn't say, Peter, are you sorry? Peter, will you never do that again, Peter? Promise. Peter, do you remember what happened at the last time you were around a charcoal fire? Do you remember that? That's not what he says. Because in our heaviest moments, in our worst pain, in the weight of our sin, Jesus reminds us of what he has done and what he's calling us to. There's not condemnation and shame. There's saving grace and love and purpose and redemption and restoration and a reinstating of Peter's life. He asked him three times, uh, he was asked three times, do you know that man? And he said no. And so Jesus says three times, do you love me? And, and every single time he's asked that question, he's doing something in Peter's life. Yes, I know you do, Peter, and I'm reinstating you. Are you sure though? Yes, I'm redeeming you, Peter. Yes, I'm restoring you, Peter. Because for Peter, he thought, uh, everything I knew is, is gone. My dreams of ministry with Jesus are dead because he's dead. And even if he is alive, why would he want me? I said no three times. His dreams, his hopes, his aspirations, his future, all of it he feels is laid to rest in the very tomb that Jesus was in. But when Jesus comes, he says, listen, I bring resurrection life to anyone and everyone who will receive me. And for Peter, this isn't his end. Are you hearing me this morning? Like, Peter assumed he was dead in his sin, dead in his denials, dead in his misery, dead in his mistakes. His heart was beating probably so fast, but his future, his future felt like it was still and dead. But Jesus challenged Peter to see the love of the cross, the grace and the mercy that restores the resurrection power that breathes life into every dream, every person, every soul, and says there is life for all of you. This is the good news of Jesus. Not just this happened one moment for him, but that for all who love him will be restored. Peter may have denied him, but he's getting redeemed, restored, reinstated. Resurrection, church, resurrection power can breathe life into anything you think is dead. People have walked in here to church this morning, and although they've put on the, the best Easter Sunday and feel so good, there is something going on that feels dead, buried. And Jesus is saying, when I breathe life into that thing, and when I breathe life into you, there is nothing too far gone for me. If there is any Sunday a church should say amen and knows that is true, it's Easter Sunday, church. Come on, somebody. That, I know there are people who have walked in here who feel like, my marriage, it's been good, it's a, it was a good run. 12 years ain't bad. Kid or two out of it. Yeah, you know what, but we're just, we're mostly just friends now. We're mostly just Buddies. Phileo love here, but but agape. No. Not when it comes to Resurrection Sunday, church. There's no marriage or relationship. There's no brokenness between a mother and a daughter or son or father, a daughter or son that Jesus cannot restore and redeem. 
There is no dream in here, a job change, a loss of someone, a loss of something where Jesus says, I cannot fix that brokenness. There is no physical body in here that is too physically sick for Jesus to come and say, listen, there is a resurrection power and healing and wholeness for you. This is the whole point, church. Not that we would just know about a resurrection, not that we would just attend Resurrection Sunday, but that we would live in resurrection power because his victory is your victory. His healing is your healing. Peter's restoration around the fire is also your restoration right here around this altar. That's the gospel. We don't talk about it enough because we, we're always trying to, in, in culture today, make it look like we, don't have, like we have it all figured out. I don't need help. I'm fine. What does fine stand for? Trina was freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and something else. I don't remember. Right? Peter is not fine. He's sitting with resurrected Jesus, and he can't say a word because of what he said and did. And so many of us, we come to church, we come around other people, and we think, I'm good. I just got to, I'm fine. I know there are hearts in here, maybe even watching online. Or one thing you said or did, you feel there's no amount of forgiveness or grace or mercy that could give you the, the freedom your soul is hungry for. Nothing could be further from the truth. He breathes life into anything you think is dead. Jesus sees us today, church. He, as he saw Peter and he says, if you would just come to me and love me, I will reinstate you and we will do life together like you never thought possible. Jesus doesn't just resurrect himself, but in that moment for all those who come to him, he says, don't die to your sin. Don't do that. I did that. Do you recognize that? Now, we are, or, or, it, sometimes we just try and make it feel like everything's okay, and we brush it all aside, but some of us, we every single day beat ourselves up for the mistake we've made. But that's the whole point of the cross. We're so busy putting ourselves to a cross, we forget that that's what Jesus went to the cross for. And so we, we speak words of, of ill over ourselves, we beat ourselves up mentally, whatever it may be. But Jesus did that. He took the weight, the pain, the hurt, so that we could live with hope, living hope, so we could live in freedom, real freedom, so we could live in the grace and truth of Jesus. And if we turn to him, guys, every dream has a chance. Every life has purpose. Every person in here has value, and Jesus is placing it on you right now. Amen. And I know the things ahead of you look hard and difficult. You don't think that Peter felt that? Standing around or sitting around that fire? hearing Jesus ask him if he loves him. But the thing about God is he is more than able, we believe. This thought, this song, this rhythm on our heart, he is more than able. Our God is not scared of whatever you're scared of. Every sin, every burden nailed to the cross. So whatever you're walking through, he sympathizes with you. We, the Bible says we have a great high priest who knows all, who can sympathize with us because of what he walked through. There is no, nothing in here, no fear, no sin that Jesus is scared of or, or worried about. He sees you, he loves you, he's more than able, church. It could be your dream, it could be a relationship, it could be your physical body. We here at Elam believe in resurrection power, that God goes above and beyond. He does the immeasurably more, that you don't have to stay broken and hurting, that he changes lives here today. Because I think for many of us, we feel like, well, that's great for Peter and the early church, but what about now? I read this story recently I want to share with you as I close today about a man who had a good life. He knew the Lord and had seen some powerful things in his time. One day this man was just driving and his heart gave out. He was rushed to the hospital. Three heart specialists were working on him, and they discovered he had a rare blood disease that was not curable, but treatable. So for 10 years, he went weekly to receive treatments from the hospital. 
about four years after that, because of his weakened heart, he was getting another surgery. And in that surgery, again, because of his weakened heart, um, he had a bad reaction to some of the, the anesthetic, and his heart stopped, gave out. His body lay still, totally froze stiff. He wrote to me once, he said, I actually was dead for four minutes until finally they brought me back. They brought me back when my vitals were, 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 were not well. And so for a whole week, he sat with hard vitals and nothing was working until his church prayed. He got a call, his church prayed for him, and he walked out that afternoon. Unfortunately, though, months later, still with a bit of a weakened heart, he, in a routine check, had his doctor saying, I think we need to do some more tests. Some things I don't love here. And in that routine check, a few more tests were ordered, a bone scan specifically, and his doctor came in and said, I'm, I'm so sorry, but you have 19 tumors in your brain, excuse me, in your skull, your abdomen, your back, your hips, and your ribs. It's very aggressive. You may only have a couple months to live. He wrote, he says, so I went to my home church, and when the prayer team was called up, I was anointed with oil. I was prayed for to have complete healing. On Monday, following that prayer, he started a treatment brand new. Needed approval from other doctors to get it. He starts getting the chemo. And right away the nurse says, listen, this is going to hurt. This is going to be painful. Tell me right away when you feel side effects. You're going to have shortness of breath. You're going to have severe pain in your legs and back. You'll probably be throwing up for at least two hours. So they started the injection, and she was asked, this man, how do you feel? He said, I feel great. She laughed, well, it's going to get worse, don't worry. He went through that whole treatment, nothing. He smiled and said, Jesus will get me through this. Came back the next session, and they said, this time it's going to be bad. Nothing. No pain. And throughout his entire chemo, he felt no side effects and did not miss a single day of work. After all the chemo, after all the drug treatments, after another bone scan, he received notice from his doctor. After many prayers with different staff members, after different moments of prayer on his knees and by himself, he received notice from his doctor that all 19 of his cancer tumors were gone. Here's what's so powerful. Two weeks ago, that same man called me. He said, Pastor Lucas, my tumors are gone, but they just did another bone scan. And they're telling me that the scar tissue from those tumors is disappearing. And that man is Reg Howe, and he sits there every single Sunday. And he's a testimony of the resurrection power in our church. And we can sit here and debate and talk about Peter and we can talk about these things but there is testimony of resurrection life in this room and it's not the only one that what is a broken body of 19 tumors with prayer and anointing with oil and a passionate church that loves to pray for people sees resurrection power in real life in real lifetime right now right here we have a God who says I can defeat cancer we have a God who says, I can heal marriages. We have a God who says, my resurrection power, nothing gets in the way of what I want to do. No amount of doubt, fear, pain, or shame gets in the way of what the Savior wants to do. What he, I said this last week, and it means so much now. He gets the final word, church. His victory, His truth, His love for you. And the story of this man sitting right here, and all that God has done in his life. And I know there is more in this room. And he said, what I love about Reggie, he said this to me, he said, you know what, it didn't actually matter if I was healed here on earth because I knew I'd be healed in heaven. And that's the good news we have. Yes, life here. Yes, power now. I want us to live in that church. For the, good, for the, for the sake of Saskatoon, we need to live in resurrection power. But also... Even though, despite whatever may come our way in our city, in our lives, in our marriages, in our time here, He gives eternal life. He defeated death for eternity. That there is heaven that we get to chase and enjoy. So whether it's now or later, I am restored.
Whether it's now or later, I am healed. Whether it's now or later, I am redeemed. Whether it's now or later, my sin has been defeated and I trust Him more than ever before because He is more than able, church. He is more than able. Resurrection power gives the final word. And I want you to hold on to that this morning. Would you close your eyes and let me pray with you as I, as I wrap up our time together. Heavenly Father, I pray over every single soul here today. Jesus, I pray over every marriage, every relationship, every connection, Lord. I pray you would mend and heal the pain and, and the wounds of, resur of, of relationship in here by your resurrection power. Jesus, we ask there would not be a single family member who leaves here today who does not believe that God can reconcile and bring people back together in a powerful way. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would cover every physical body here today for the person who does have a terrible diagnosis, for the person who is wrestling with depression and anxiety, for the person who feels like there is no hope and is riddled with just this endless amount of darkness. Jesus, we ask that you would cover them, breathe life and light over every, every soul, every mind. Bring clarity, Jesus, in ways people do not think was possible. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would breathe life into the dreams that feel dead in here, the goals, the future, the job, whatever it may be, God. I pray, Lord, that the things you have called us to do and live by, Lord, we would hold on to so tightly because your resurrection power gives us the way to do it. Jesus, for the person in here who feels their sin is too big, their pain is too heavy, you bring them close to you right now and remind them that your grace is enough, that you are still God who does miracles, that we can run and turn to you because you are more than able. Your word says you do immeasurably more. So I pray right now you would break people free of the bondage of sin. I have a picture of just chains literally breaking off right now for someone a heart wrapped around in chains, hands wrapped around in chains, eyes, even, even eyes, Lord. Break every chain in Jesus' name. Bring hope and healing and wholeness to every family in life here. Lord, we love you, and we need your resurrection power more than anything else. That is our prayer. That is our hope. That is our desire. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Would you stand to your feet all across this, this auditorium, this sanctuary? going to sing one more song this morning before we close and if you would I want to share that even in my own life I'm a guy who thinks that I can get by on my own strength all the time and I'm telling you right here right now it is not true we need Jesus and I've tried my best to walk in my own strength and every time it leaves me wanting and hoping for more, struggling or frustrated, whatever I try and do to my flesh, church, it doesn't work. And so can we just cut it and stop? And for someone in here, I know there's someone in here who's come who's maybe new or new-ish and you've been asking questions and you've been thinking about this whole faith thing and I'm telling you right now, to place your trust, your hope in Jesus is the best place to place your whole life. He is who you need. Not even what you need. You think you might need something or this, or if I just got up earlier, if I just... It's Jesus. It starts with Him. And so one more time, if you would just close your eyes in this room. And if you're ready to actually say, Jesus, I want this redemption. I want this restoration. I, I feel a lot like Peter where I've done something and I'm scared to say anything. Jesus is coming right now and He wants to fill your life and fill your heart and give you what you need. He says come, right? That's His invitation. He invites you to come. He's searching for you. He's on the shore. He's screaming out to you saying, come. And so if you're humble enough to do it, would you just for you, if you want to make a statement, a decision to say, I want to follow Jesus, I want to put my trust in Him, my family, everything I have, just lift your hands. I do this as a sign of surrender. It's just to remind myself, I need Him, something bigger than me. And with your eyes closed, just pray a prayer like this. You can repeat after me. You don't have to. It's a sincere heart Jesus is after, but just say, Jesus, 
Maybe for you, you're recommitting. You're saying, this is it. I'm tired of going back and forth. Jesus, I need you more than anything else. Thank you for the cross. Forgive me, Lord. I tried to do it on my own, but now I want you. Be Lord of my life. Be Lord over everything I have. You are my everything now. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your love because you are more than able. Breathe your resurrection power on the things I think are dead, Lord. I run to you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you believe in resurrection power today, church? Let's sing. sufficient for me and why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles you are more than able yes,
you sing that chorus? There's nothing that is beyond him. Let's celebrate in this house this morning. That is worth celebrating. That there's no denying what the Lord can do in our lives. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. Thank you so much for coming this Easter. Just a couple housekeepings as we go. If you've got kids, please make sure you go pick them up in their normal classrooms before taking them to the inflatables and stuff like that, just to make sure that that all runs super smoothly. A reminder, if you prayed that prayer with Pastor Lucas and you're saying, hey, I need that resurrection power in my life, make sure you go to the Start Here booth right in the atrium. Someone would love to meet with you, pray with you, and talk about how we can walk that journey with you. And please join us next week to continue the celebration as we're celebrating 14 people that are making the decision to get baptized and declare their love for Jesus. And just as we are leaving, if you do need prayer for anything, if you need healing, if you need any sort of prayer, please, the prayer team's going to come forward now, and you're welcome to come and pray. And let me just pray a blessing as we go. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. God, we thank you that the tomb is empty. God, we thank you that your grave clothes are folded because you don't need them anymore because, God, you not only rose from the dead, but you, God, you ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us. God, we thank you that because you defeated death, God, we can live eternally with you. God, that our sin and our shame were nailed to that cross with you. And God, you took them into the grave and they stayed there. God, and as a result of that, we don't need to worry, God. We don't need to worry about our sin, God, because we know that you have forgiven us. God, there's nothing that can come between us and the Father. In your holy name we pray. Amen.